Hi, everyone. I hope everyone's doing well today. Um, my name is Melissa McCarver. We're just going to wait a few minutes to get started for everybody to join. Um, get started. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, today's webinar is on wildlife management for landowners. I would like to thank all our sponsors for today's webinar. Um, thanks to Beaver Water District, Quail Forever, Arkansas Game and Fish Commission, as well as the Arkansas Forestry Association. I'm your host, Melissa McCarver, with the Beaver Watershed Alliance. Um, we have two guest speakers today, Jessica Cox, an Arkansas Farm Bill biologist with Quail Forever, and Hugh Lumpkin, a private lands biologist with the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission. Just a few housekeeping items today. If you have any questions, um, feel free to hit the Q&A bubble on your screen and ask them as we go along, um, and our speakers will answer them. Um, as we go along, or we might wait till the very end um, if they're a general question. Um, this webinar will be available on demand if you miss anything. Um, tomorrow I'll be posting it on Beaver Watershed Alliance's YouTube channel. So, and I'll also be, and I'll send you a link via email. I want, want to start off today with a brief introduction into who the Beaver Watershed Alliance is. Um, the Alliance is a nonprofit located in Northwest Arkansas. Our headquarters is in Springdale. Our mission is to proactively protect, enhance, and sustain the water quality in Beaver Lake and the integrity of its watershed. We accomplish this mission through the entire watershed area by voluntary best management practice implementation on residential, pasture, and forested landscapes to improve water quality. We work with partner agencies to conduct analysis and research within the watershed to monitor water quality trends and help prioritize our work. The goals of the Beaver Watershed Alliance include maintaining a long-term high quality drinking water supply to meet current needs and continuing growth of our region. Beaver Lake provides water for one in six in Arkansas. We also want to restore water quality of impaired streams, work on voluntary educational programs and projects that lead to best management practice use, and foster communication among diverse stakeholders. This is a picture of the Upper White River Watershed, uh, or the Greater White River Watershed. The overlay map is just of the Beaver Watershed where we prioritize our work and Beaver Lake was built back in the 1960s um, for flood control, um, but we use it for drinking water and that's our main goal is to keep our drinking water um, good. good. Um, that's it. We want to thank our state and federal partners that help protect and conserve our natural resources as well. 
I want to hand this first off to Jessica with Quail Forever, who is going to talk about financial assistance um, programs that help with wildlife management. So she wants to go. Okay. Thank you for that introduction, Melissa. One moment and let me get my presentation pulled up. Okay, um, so good afternoon. As Melissa said, my name is Jessica Cox. I'm a farm bill biologist with Quell Forever. Um, I'd like to thank each of you for tuning into this webinar and thanks to the Beaver Watershed Alliance for putting this on. Uh, with nearly 90% of Arkansas land being privately owned, uh, it's especially critical that landowners such as yourselves take the initiative um, to help us restore and enhance wildlife habitat uh, across the state of Arkansas. Um, during this presentation, as Melissa said, I will be discussing uh, some assistance that is available to landowners who are interested in enhancing their uh, wildlife habitat on their property. And then Hugh Lumpkin with the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission will follow my presentation with a discussion on what practices you should use to improve your habitat and why they are beneficial. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Before we begin, I would first like to take a moment to discuss why habitat restoration on a landscape scale is important. Um, historically, the Ozark landscape was dominated by open woodlands and large expanses of grasslands and prairies. Um, glades were found throughout these woodlands and native grasses and forbs flourished as fire held a near constant presence across the landscape whether by natural means or by Native Americans uh, who used prescribed fire extensively for hundreds of years. It's under these conditions that our native wildlife adapted and thrived. So over the last several decades, however, uh, poor land management practices and a general lack of resources created a landscape on which many of our native flora and fauna are not adapted to. Thankfully, there is still hope. So by implementing a few best management practices from the land manager's toolbox, we can recreate many of the conditions under which wildlife thrives. Um, so now that you kind of have an idea of why this restoration is so important, uh, let's discuss some of those tools I was referring to earlier. <clears throat> so landowner assistance. As land managers and owners, it can sometimes be hard to decide what the right course of action may be when considering implementing changes on your property. Time, space, and expense must all be considered during the planning process. And thankfully, there are many resources that are available to landowners that will make this planning process much easier. So technical assistance. A great way to get the ball rolling on your habitat project is by contacting your local experts for technical assistance. Um, those experts can include wildlife biologists such as myself or Hugh, local foresters, NRCS conservation technicians, grazing and grassland specialists, water quality or district technicians, and many more. Uh, the type of advice you need will obviously depend on the type of operation you have, whether you have cattle, uh, whether you have hayland, uh, timber, that's all going to uh, be a big part in the people that are involved in your project. Um, but as private land professionals, we can also provide contact information for vendors, for companies and individuals uh, who can provide the actual manual labor to implement certain practices. Uh, we also have a, a bunch of fact sheets and landowner guides that we'd be more than happy to send you that would help to assist in the decision making process. Um, our technical guidance is always just a phone call or an email away. And at the end of this presentation, I've included contact information for several useful organizations that all provide technical assistance to landowners free of charge. So as Melissa said, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted to their YouTube channel um, for you to go back to if you need to refer to any of these contacts. Um, expense can, be, can make or break any aspect of a restoration project. So to help offset some of the costs of implementing these practices, Many federal, state, and non-government or non-profit organizations uh, are available to help provide cost share or financial assistance to qualified landowners. For the sake of time, I'm not going to be able to cover all of the programs that are available because thankfully there are a lot, 
but I will briefly cover a few of the more popular programs that we see landowners go through. <clears throat> so NRCS will be the first organization I'm going to talk about. It's the Natural Resources Conservation Service, which is a federal agency under the United States Department of Agriculture. This agency has many programs that are available to landowners who are looking to improve uh, their natural resources on their land. I will be discussing two of these programs, the EQIP program and the RCPP program, of which there are two projects that can be used to improve wildlife habitat. The Arkansas Game and Fish Commission, or the AGFC, which is a state agency, also has several habitat restoration programs that are available to landowners. Um, their Acres for Wildlife program and Native Grazing Demonstration Projects program are the two that I will discuss uh, in this webinar. So first we'll talk a little bit about the EQIP program or the Environmental Quality Incentives Program and how it can assist you. So EQIP is a voluntary program that provides both technical and cost share assistance to private landowners. During the planning process, NRCS conservation technicians will assist you in developing a detailed conservation plan that outlines your resource concerns in conjunction with your goals and objectives. Technical assistance is provided at no cost to the landowner and farmers, ranchers, and forest landowners who own or rent agricultural lands are eligible. This is a competitive program and applications are ranked based on the number of resource concerns being addressed on your property. Practices or improvements have set cost share rates that are updated each year. Payment for installed practices is paid following the completion of each practice according to NRCS standards and specifications. So we do have uh, certain ways that these practices must be installed in order for us to pay on them. Uh, practice certification will be completed by an NRCS representative and special payment rates may apply to those landowners who qualify as beginning farmer ranchers uh, or economically and socially disadvantaged. Um, there is also special payment rates that certain qualifying veterans may also be eligible for. So if you're interested in going through EQIP, uh, you should begin by scheduling an appointment at your local NRCS office. And at the end in the contact information, I have provided the website for NRCS where you can search by county to find your office's contact information. Um, during this visit, that NRCS representative will discuss program policies and available practices that are based on your goals and objectives. Uh, they will also be able to assist you in selecting the program that will best suit your needs. If you are only seeking technical assistance, a site visit can be completed and a conservation plan developed detailing the best management practices you can implement to address the resource concerns documented on your property during that site visit. <clears throat> if you're interested in applying for cost share assistance, you will first have to establish a farm and track number with the Farm Service Agency. Once your farm and track numbers are established, you can submit your application along with some other required documentation at your local NRCS office. Applications are accepted year round. However, only applications received before a specified date will be eligible for funding during the current fiscal year. So for example, the application deadline for fiscal year 2020 was, in, was February 28th of this year. So any applications accepted after that date will be eligible for funding during fiscal year 2021. <clears throat> uh, once your application has been received, a site visit will be conducted on your property to document all existing resource concerns. Um, so I want to point out that these resource concerns don't have to be directly associated with wildlife either. So NRCS has a wide range of conservation practices that help to address all resource concerns um, including livestock and forage production, timber management, uh, water quality, soil health, um, all different resource concerns. So if you are interested in wildlife, but you also have livestock that you're interested in managing, uh, they can assist in both of those areas, which is great. Um, after the site visit is completed, um, we will develop a conservation plan that outlines all of the resource concerns that we documented on your property 
and the, spe the specific practices that you can implement uh, either on your own or through cost share that can help to address those resource concerns. Um, <clears throat> and during this time, other more specific management plans may be completed um, by other specialists such as Hugh or myself if you need a wildlife management plan. Your local forester can create forest management plans. We can also have grazing plans and nutrient management plans developed to assist in the, in the planning process. Uh, following the determination of resource concerns and practices to be installed, the applications will be ranked and funding determinations will be made. An NRCS representative will contact you regarding the funding status of your application. Um, because ranking is completed based on the benchmark or existing conditions of the property, so at the time we do the site visit, it is important that no work is completed during, uh, between the time that the site visit happens and funding obligations. So let's briefly discuss a few of the practices that are available through the EQIP program. Hugh will be going into more detail uh, here in a little bit about how each of these practices benefit wildlife, but just to give you an idea of some of the things that are available to landowners. Um, so conservation cover is a practice designed for the establishment of native grasses and wildflowers on land that is not used for grazing. So if you have a fallow field or an old hay field that you're not using anymore, or you have an old pasture that no longer has cattle on it, this practice can be used to convert those fields into native grass and forb fields. Um, there is no minimum acreage that can be, I'm sorry, there's no maximum acreage that can be enrolled. However, there is a minimum acreage of half an acre to be eligible for this practice. Tree and shrub planting uh, is for the establishment of native trees and shrubs in area where, areas where wildlife is identified as a resource concern. Uh, around here, we don't often do tree plantings. The shrub plantings are more what we're going for, um, but associated with this practice is also a practice for um, the site prep to actually go in and install um, the shrubby thickets that are gonna be great for your wildlife, which he will go into a little bit more detail on later. Prescribed burning. So this practice is to conduct prescribed burning on any land where wildlife, uh, where wildlife habitat is a resource concern or where wildfire hazard um, has been identified as a resource concern. So it is applicable on both forest land and pasture grassland areas. So we can assist in prescribed burning of your woods and we can also assist in prescribed burning of your grassland. Uh, a prescribed burn plan is required for payment to be made on this practice. So if you want to sign up for this, we'll have to put together a burn plan. Um, and there is no minimum or maximum acreage. Fire breaks. So this practice is for the installation of bare soil or vegetated fire breaks on forest land. Uh, for, to meet NRCS standards and specifications, fire breaks must be a minimum of 15 feet wide and have water bars installed, which will help to prevent erosion. Permanent fire breaks are not eligible practices on pasture or grassland areas, as there are other less um, intrusive methods for creating fire breaks around these areas. Um, for example, you can put in a mowed line or a disc line or a wet line um, there's really no point in taking things down to bare soil in those areas. Um, and then natural fire breaks such as roads, creeks, streams, and rock outcroppings should be used whenever possible. We really want to minimize the number of bare soil fire breaks we're putting on the landscape, especially in this part of the state, which can uh, have extreme slopes and uh, the possible for serious erosion problems. Um, existing roads cannot be enhanced with this practice. So if you have an existing road cutting through the property that you want to use as a fire break, that's great, but we can't pay to enhance that road uh, into a fire break that meet our standards and specifications. Um, payment for this practice is paid by the linear foot, and while there is no minimum footage, there is a maximum uh, footage cap that does apply to this practice.
Forest land improvement. Um, this practice applies to any forest land where your species composition and degraded plant condition have been identified as resource concerns. So if you don't quite have the species out there that you're wanting, you have a lot of undesirable species such as uh, eastern red cedar, we can use this practice to help uh, take care of those undesirable species. Um, a current forestry management plan that documents the existing and planned conditions is required. And the planned removal of 20% of the total basal area, which is um, a density measurement of your forest, uh, must be, so 20% of that has to be removed while still maintaining forested conditions. And all that will be documented in your forestry management plan. Uh, payment rate is based on the method that you use. So there's various methods that he will go into, such as the hack and squirt method or single stem hand tool, which is you know, using a chainsaw to go out there and cut the trees down. And there is no minimum or maximum acreage caps on this practice. Riparian buffers. So this practice applies to land uses where streams or other water conveyance channels need to be protected. That can either be in forested areas or on pastures where you have cattle. Um, as you can see in the picture, we can fence those riparian areas off and establish native vegetation along the stream banks to help protect water quality um, and to keep your land from eroding. So we do have, uh, as I said, a few practices that are applicable for livestock and they're um, there are several things that you can do if you have livestock that are beneficial for both your livestock and for your native wildlife. One of those is forage and biomass planting. So this practice applies to pasture lands where um, inadequate feed and forage or undesirable plant communities are present um, and can be, can be used to convert non-native forage systems. So if you have Bermuda or fescue fields um, into native grazing systems. Uh, current soils tests are required for this practice, and those can be obtained from the University of Arkansas Extension Service for a free charge for landowners in Arkansas. Um, but this is a great way if you're looking to start small and maybe try to experiment with some native grazing, this is a great um, practice to use for that. Um, and then to go along with that, we have prescribed grazing, which applies to pasture land where a rotational grazing system um, will be implemented. Um, so a rotational grazing system should be used when grazing or converting to native grasses. Uh, it's extremely critical that your native grasses are not overgrazed and having a prescribed grazing plan uh, in place can help prevent that. And we can help assist in the cross fencing and putting in water, which I'll get to shortly. <clears throat> so the fencing practice applies only to cross fencing and exclusion fencing. Uh, we do not provide cost share for perimeter fencing around the property. Um, so it's applicable to pasture lands where rotational grazing uh, will be implemented or for areas where cattle need to be excluded. Um, in the picture, you can see that there's a forested area. So a fence has been installed that keeps the cattle from going into the forest and further degrading it. Payment for this practice is based on the linear foot as well, similar to the fire breaks. And again, there's no minimum footage, but there is maximum footage caps that do apply to this practice. Water, so we do help to establish water sources for livestock on your property if you're looking to implement the rotational grazing and break your system into paddocks. Uh, we do have assistance that's available to uh, make sure that you have water that's of good quality, quantity, and distribution for your cattle. Um, again, it can be very helpful when you're establishing your rotational grazing systems to make sure that water is available to your cattle at all times. Uh, our water systems include ponds, wells, water tanks, and then we also assist with putting in pipeline and heavy use areas around the watering areas. A couple of other practices that we, that we provide assistance on are herbaceous weed control and brush management. So these practices are intended for use, uh, land uses where herbaceous and woody species have become problematic and where degraded plant condition and plant pest pressure have been identified as resource concerns. So I'm sure 
a lot of you are probably very familiar with some of the pictures on the screen. Um, you see these uh, species um, come into your pastures along the edge of your woodlands where there's a lot of disturbance and we can actually help to identify those species and we will pay for the chemical application to control them. Uh, unfortunately, only specific species are eligible for this practice. So during the site visit with myself or Hugh or the NRCS representative, we will uh, identify if these species are present. Um, so examples for the herbaceous weed control are Cerecia lespedeza, which I don't have pictured. It was actually just recently added to the list. Um, horse nettle, cockleburr, plantain, thistle, red sorrel, and curly dock are all on that list. And there were a few others, again, that were just recently added. And then examples for brush management include uh, eastern red cedar, sumac, persimmon, and blackberry. So there's more woody species that tend to creep up on, on unmanaged land um, and kind of shade out the grasses. Nothing can really grow underneath them. We can help to control those. Um, for more information about EQIP or any of these practices that I've mentioned, please contact uh, myself or your local NRCS often office. There's a lot of information, so um, I know it may feel like you're kind of drinking out of a water hose <laughs> right now um, with all this being thrown at you. Um, but like I said, for, if you have any other questions, just give us a call. We'd be more than happy to help. <clears throat> so the next program I'm going to talk about is the RCPP or the Regional Conservation Partnership Program. Um, this program promotes the coordination of NRCS conservation activities with partners that offer um, value-added contributions, whether that be financial contributions or contributions with their staff and time uh, to expand our collective ability to address resource concerns. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the first uh, project I'm going to talk about within this program is the North Arkansas Quail Focal Landscape Project. Um, so the North Arkansas Quail Focal Landscape Project aims to restore and enhance early secessional habitat specifically for Bob White quail across North Arkansas. Um, the cool thing about quail though is that when you're managing for quail on your property, you're managing for just about every other species that we have, whether it be your wild turkeys, your deer, other grassland birds, reptiles, um, you name it. Quail well, habitat generally provides all the stuff that all of our wildlife needs. Um, so the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission, uh, who is the lead partner on this project, along with six other organizations, have partnered together to provide cost share and technical assistance for landowners within eligible counties. And those eligible counties can be seen on your screen outlined in red. Um, these areas across the state have been identified as priority areas for, um, for quail habitat. And so only landowners, and I say landowners, you can live outside of these areas, but as long as your land, the land is physically located in one of these counties, you are eligible uh, to receive cost share assistance through, um, through this project. Um, now within that focal area, the large focal area, we do have uh, certain priority areas that have been established and those have been established based on work that is already being done. Most of these areas you see on your screen are either WMAs or other public lands that have been actively managed for quail well habitat for years. So we try to focus around those areas um, and give more priority to landowners in those areas. Um, the green areas on the map that have the blue, or I'm sorry, the yellow uh, buffer circles around them, those are our high priority areas. So in this part of the world, you can see up in Benton County, that's going to be Pea Ridge National Military Park, who have been doing a great job of restoring quail habitat um, on the park. The ring is a five-mile buffer around the park, so any landowners within that five-mile buffer um, are considered high priority. The blue areas on your screen with the red buffer boundaries, those are our medium area priorities. <clears throat> and again, the five mile buffer landowners within that are eligible as medium priority. And then the kind of gold, yellow colored um, polygons on your screen, those are other medium priority areas. Again, either WMAs or areas where 
uh, previous work has been done. So funding for this project was set for three years uh, at about $200,000 per year across all 15 counties. Uh, last year was our first round of funding um, for this program and the application for the second year of funding was back, uh, was due on May 15th of this year. Um, so if you didn't get signed up by then and you're interested, don't worry, there's still time. We still have an entire year of funding left for this project, so it's not too late. Um, like EQIP, applications are accepted year round, but only those accepted by that application deadline are eligible for funding during the current fiscal year. The cost share through the program is 100%, unlike EQIP, which is usually a 60% cost share. Um, this program is 100% with NRCS paying 75% of the total cost and the Game and Fish paying the remaining 25%. Uh, receipts and other documentation of work will be required for payment. Uh, in order to qualify for cost share assistance through this program, the land must be located within one of those eligible counties that was highlighted in red and a couple slides back. Um, a farm and track number must be established with the Farm Service Agency. And then your application and other necessary documentation must be completed at your local NRCS office. So NRCS will handle the application and the documentation, the site visits um, for this uh, project. Uh, it's nearly identical to that of EQIP, um, but available practices and payment rates uh, will differ through this program. And I believe Hugh will discuss some of those practices that are going to be available um, through this project. The next program I want to talk about, or project, that's an RCPP project as well, um, is that we have uh, partnered with uh, the BWA on is the West Fork White River Initiate Restoration RCPP project. Um, the West Fork White River Restoration project was developed to improve and protect water quality in Northwest Arkansas. <clears throat> the West Fork of the White River is a major that only a small section of the West Fork White River watershed that you can see here uh, highlighted in red. So that was the initial focal point of the project. Um, however, the project has now um, been extended to include the entire watershed that you can see outlined in purple on your screen. Uh, partners from several, several organizations, and I won't name them all, but you can uh, put them on the list for you to see. They've either put in uh, time or money on this project. Um, and so they're working together to enhance and protect the water quality within this watershed while also um, restoring the local ecological uh, parts of the, the watershed as well. So the goals of this project, there are many goals that are out, that have been outlined in the project, um, many of which are related to the direct improvement of wildlife habitat, which is why this is such a great project, because you're not only getting the wildlife habitat uh, restoration benefits, but you're also improving your water quality at the same time. Um, eligible landowners within the defined project boundary are eligible to receive free technical assistance from a wide range of specialists, uh, including site visits and those detailed conservation plans that I keep hitting on. Um, cost share assistance is also available for specific practices. Um, the application process is very similar to that of EQIP, although again, the practices that are available and payment rates may vary. As you can see on the screen, there are a great number of practices. Um, so there's the technical assistance. There's a great number of practices that are available to landowners, uh, not only for wildlife habitat and stream bank restoration, but also for livestock and CAFO operations, as well as cropland and hayland operations. Um, so as I was saying earlier, what we're really looking to do is, you know, 
whole property management. So regardless if it's wildlife, we really want to get in there to address those resource concerns. And having these practices to assist landowners in doing that just helps everybody in the long run. So to qualify for this program, the land enrolled, again, must be within the designated project boundary. Um, you can refer back to the boundary map that I had earlier in this presentation, or I believe Melissa also had a map in her presentation. Uh, farm and track number must be established with the farm service agency and an application and other necessary documentation uh, will be completed at your local NRCS office. So just like the North Arkansas 12 local landscape project, all of the application and documentation will take place through your local NRCS office. Um, real quick, I wanted to take a second. I know I've been talking about a farm and track number um, that's, that you have to have established for these federal programs. Um, some of the common questions, essentially what you do is you take a copy of your deed to the Farm Services Agency, and they will establish a farm and track number, which is basically a number that is, associated, that is tying you to your property. So it, there's, it has nothing necessarily to do with taxes, or anything like that. It's just a way that when we are planning um, through these programs that we can make sure that the property we're planning on is your property. We don't want to get into boundary disputes with neighbors, um, so they do go based on what it shows in your deed. And again, it's just a way to tie your property with you. Um, so those are very important to have and are often the first step in many of these programs to get established. Now I'm going to go into some of the programs that's offered by the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission. Um, like I said, they have several programs that are available to landowners. And the first one that I want to talk about is their Acres for Wildlife program. Um, it was designed to provide technical and cost share assistance to landowners across the state who are trying to improve their habitat. So for this program, there is no um, eligibility areas. It is a statewide program that's available to all private landowners um, to receive assistance, um, but there are minimum and macro, maximum acreage caps applicable to this program. So the minimum uh, land you can have for this program is uh, five contiguous acres with the maximum uh, generally being 40 acres. So to find out if you are eligible or to submit an application for this program, you need to contact your local um, game and fish public lands biologist or Quell Forever Wildlife Biologist. Uh, we will discuss program details and specifications and identify your objectives. An application can be submitted directly to the AGFC regional office or through your local biologist. Applications for this program are accepted year-round and are fulfilled until supplies run out. A site visit will be completed with a biologist and a detailed wildlife management plan will be completed. This again is a competitive program and applications will be ranked by the, by the biologist that is handling your project. So the practices um, that are offered through this program, so unlike EQIP and RCPP programs, the Acres for Wildlife program does not provide monetary cost share assistance anymore. Um, in the past, we did have cost share practices uh, in this program. Those have since been taken out. Um, so right now, what we provide is native seed and the herbicide required for a native grass wildflower conversion. So we actually provide the seed to you and provide the herbicide. And then Game and Fish also has equipment that's available for landowners to use um, to apply the herbicide and to plant the seed. So there's no actual um, exchange of money. There's no cost share financial assistance. Just we provide you with the materials um, to do those conversions. So <clears throat> if you are, um, if your application is accepted or approved, the biologist that is handling your project will give you the seed um, and the herbicide that's necessary for the site prep, which you know may be one, two, sometimes three sprains. And then again, they also have equipment um, that landowners can use. And I wanted to point out, while I don't have a slide for it, um, the Game and Fish and Quill Forever Biologists also offer Learn to Burn classes throughout the year for landowners that are interested in learning more about prescribed fire 
and how to safely conduct prescribed burn. So if you're interested in more information on those on those workshops, um, please let myself or Hugh know. We can get you added to the list. Um, let us know what county you're in. So when we have a workshop in your county, then we can let you know when that'll be. And then the last project uh, that I'm gonna talk about is the Native Grazing Demonstration Project. Um, it's a new program that the Game of Fish has released uh, to assist landowners in the conversion of non-native grazing pastures into native grazing systems. So this, pro this project is designed specifically for grazing land. Um, it provides landowners with both technical assistance and just like in the Acres for Wildlife program, the seed and the herbicide required to convert the pastures. Uh, in this program, the landowners must be willing to allow game and fish and quail forever biologists to monitor their cattle for gains, um, monitor their forage um, and wildlife responses to the native grazing, and should be willing to host field tours or workshops for native grazing on the property. And this comes with a big push for us to try to get native grasses back into the grazing landscape. Um, they can be very beneficial. That in and of itself is an entirely different webinar. Um, but it's extremely beneficial, and because so many acres are being grazed right now, um, if we can do something on those acres for wildlife as well, um, all the better. Now, we can also have grazing plans completed by NRCS grassland specialists that will be able to help you um, design a grazing system that works with your time and your objectives. And these last couple of slides, so this is the slide I was telling you about earlier that has the websites for various organizations that provide uh, landowner assistance free of charge to landowners. Um, so there's a good list of them. There's several more that I'm sure you'll find. I'm sure any one of these organizations would be able to give you five more contacts. Um, so if you're interested in finding out any more um, about these specific programs, uh, here's where to go. And then here's a map of the Arkansas Quail Forever Farm Bill biologists and their coverage area. So if for some reason you've tuned into this webinar and you're not um, in this part of the state or you're not in my coverage area or Hughes coverage area, here's a list of the Quail Forever and Arkansas Game and Fish private land biologists for across the state um, and their contact information. So you can reach out to that biologist that covers your area. And then got habitat or questions. So again, there's my contact information. And thank you again so much for tuning in to this webinar. I hope you found this information useful. And as always, if you have any comments, questions, or concerns, please feel free to reach out to me at any time. Thank you. And I will now turn the presentation over to Hugh Lumpkin. All right, just a second here. Let me, let me get it uh, loaded up. <clears throat> okay, I'm Hugh Lumpkin. I'm the uh, private lands biologist up here for this uh, northwest Arkansas part of the state. I got six counties. Benton, Washington, Carroll, Madison, uh, Boone, and Newton. And um, anyways, so since you've got a pretty good thorough overview of the uh, of the funding and some of the practice and, and different things, I'm just going to talk about some of the practices a little bit and kind of how they apply to what you may be trying to do. Can everybody hear me good? Yes, I can. Everybody's yes, good? Okay. Can. okay, so... <clears throat> Conservation cover is uh, basically just providing wildlife habitat by converting your old pastures, fescue or Bermuda or whatever, to um, native grasses and, and forbs, wildflowers. And what that does is just uh, provides a better habitat, you know, structure, plant structure um, for quail and, 
of course, other species benefit too. Uh, but it's a, it's a, it's actually, it's actually putting back what was was once there before all the the fescue and everything else was introduced. And uh, so, if you think about your tall grass prairies and stuff, that's that's basically what it is. And it it has a lot of diverse forbs and 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 generally three main grasses that we're we're generally doing. Uh, big blue stem, little blue stem, and, and Indian grass. Uh, these pictures would be hard to tell what the grasses are, but you can see some of the, a lot of the forbs and uh, ideally how it's supposed to look. Uh, and this is what people do for mon monarch uh, and pollinator mixes, you know, so uh, for the folks that are interested in, in helping the monarchs and the pollinators, that's, it's pretty much the same thing. Uh, it's good brew rearing, nesting cover for quail, and it's also, you know, great for turkeys as far as, you know, insect, in, you know, catching insects and feeding, feeding their broods too. Um, like I said, it's proper, it's, it's the actual plant structure that's needed. So basically it has some, uh, some space in between plants where, you know, quail chicks and, and things can move around and, and catch insects and bugs during, during their growth phases, so. And that looks really pretty. So, uh, uh, so early successional habitat—that's kind of the same thing uh, we're talking about. But as far as the conservation cover, er, uh, early successional habitat development. Th this example right here is uh, di creating disc strips. So if you if you did a strip a disc strip in one of those uh, you know native grass fields say 50 feet wide and then you skipped over 50 feet and then you did another 50 foot wide disc strip. It uh, keeps that field at an early successional level and it, it you know it keeps it from getting too thick. Uh, it's one it's just one method to manage native grass fields along with burning and, and other stuff but uh, and spraying uh, but it's it's a good pretty cost effective way to to keep your native grass your pollinator monarch field in uh, at a good stage. And like it says, it improves the brew green cover, increases the bare ground, which is essential for, for quail chicks. They've got to have bare ground to move, be able to move around in between the plants to catch catch insects in that early phase of their life there. And, and you know, it's, you, you rotate the strips every year, so it's a pretty, pretty simple way to do it. All right. Any questions on that? Feel free to, uh, to chime in if y'all have any questions when we go, go over these slides. All right, moving on. All right, so back into the, uh, uh, into the fire breaks and talking about burning. The fire breaks, um, so the, the key to doing a safe control burn is having good fire breaks. And uh, I've had bad fire breaks before and had lots of problems. And then I've had good fire breaks and, uh, you know, have a few problems. But, Mainly, you know, good fire breaks to help you control the burn. So we do fire breaks. Uh, you can look at these pictures, the top pictures going through the woods. That fire break be, uh, was, was probably put in with, with a dozer or maybe a, you know, a bobcat with a mulcher head on it. But uh, it's just a dozer line through the woods. Um, of course, NRCS has their specs that you have to, to go by. A lot of times we just use eight or 10 foot, but you have to do the NRCS, the RCPP, um, you have to have that 15 foot fire break. And it can wind through the woods and it goes around your, your good trees and stuff. You know, it, it doesn't have to be a straight line through the woods by any means. And then generally you can, you can, uh, man, you can manage those fire breaks and keep them up with food plots, you know, planting uh, clover, wheat, you know, whatever, depending on, you know, how much sunlight gets down there. But you manage those, uh, you keep those, those, uh, those permanent fire breaks uh, managed with little food plots. And then when you get ready to burn again, you go in there and just run a light disc over it and you're good to go. Uh, you have to have a prescribed burn plan contract, like it says, and then you can only have $7,500 worth of fire break, which that's, I, I would I would guess that's probably, that may be a mile and a half uh, or somewhere in there. Uh, NRCS has the price codes for how much they pay per, per, per linear foot and all that. And uh, so I generally let, leave that up to them to uh, let you know if it, if it goes over. But still, you can, you can max that out and, 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 and keep putting fire break down if it need be. 
Uh, and we don't go through fields and all that kind of stuff because you can pull a disc line around a field. So um, we usually put fire brakes on the borders and through the interior if there's no road, interior roads and stuff. Any questions on the fire brakes? Okay. All right, so prescribed burning, uh, it's one of our best tools to use to uh, get some get some woods back under control. Uh, this picture right here shows a, uh, some short leaf pine and whatever. It looks like it's big, like an old clear cut that's grown up. So uh, you have a lot of uh, secondary growth and, and, and stuff. And so it's real, real thick area. Um, we use uh, prescribed burning on, on, on fields that we're doing site prep for native grass or for uh, uh, timber stands that uh, need prescribed burns through there to reduce the fuel, just burn off the leaf litter, or especially after we do a timber stand improvement. Uh, and there's a lot of a lot of trash on the ground, um, or uh, like or say we're you know we've cut a lot of cedars down, so we use the the prescribed burning for those kind of things. And uh, so and also then to do a prescribed burning, you have to have a prescribed burn plan that we set up with uh, with you and NRCS in, in the in the management plan. And uh, one couple ways to do this is uh, you can either burn it yourself and get cost share to burn it, or you, if you don't feel comfortable with that, you you contract the, the burn out and then get re, you know get reimbursed for the you know however much per acre that will burn. Sometimes the NRCS cost covers it if you if you contract it out. Um, but uh, a good way to do it would be to come to our prescribed burn classes and. And learn how to burn so you can do your management plan and uh, over the years and uh, uh, that way you can you can do it yourself they're only going to pay for it uh, over one time with the contract so uh, anything about uh, anything any question about prescribed burning okay all right so <clears throat> Along with the timber stuff here, you know, you get into forest stand improvement. Uh, forest stand improvement is what we do uh, to thin the timber back out and to reduce the canopy. Uh, a, lot of, lot, a lot of the Ozarks have closed canopy systems, which you look in the woods and all there is is leaf litter and there's hardly any, veg any vegetation on the ground. Whereas you can see in this, in this bigger picture here, uh, they thin the timber down quite a bit and it's getting a lot of sunlight down there. There's a lot of vegetation. That's a lot of forage for, for deer, turkey, and a lot of cover, a lot of nesting cover. And so uh, we're just trying to uh, get it back. You know, the Indians, the, the Native Americans used to burn uh, a lot. And uh, of course, then we also used to have a lot of wildfire, wild, wildfires and such. And uh, you know, we used to have a lot of openings and open open tops along the ridges all across the Ozarks and and like a more of a savanna looking area where you have trees here and there, and now they're all closed up. So, anyways, uh, by thinning the timber, you can kind of get get that back to where it needs to be. And there, there's a couple of ways to do it. Heavy mechanicals be like if you're having a uh, a timber company come in and and harvest some timber, and a light mechanical. You know, would be like a chainsaw where you're where you're girdling it and spraying some herbicide in there, and then hack and squirt is this picture on the on the bottom left right here, and that's he's hacking all around in the cambium layer of the little trees and squirting herbicide as he goes. And uh, anyways, uh, they have different different cost share rates and stuff, but they're all they're all effective. Uh, this 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 hack and squirt leaves the trees there, but they don't. Of course, they die and they don't canopy out, but they let sunlight to the ground. And eventually they, you know, they'll, over the years, they'll fall over and, and uh, but if you're doing your, your prescribed burn plan, you're taking care of those as you go. So, uh, forest stand improvement is a great, is a great way to uh, extend your habitat from your native grass field stuff into the timber to where wildlife can use your timber a lot better. And uh, it's, it's a lot prettier too than a big choked up forest, so. Anything there? I don't know if y'all can even hear me. <laughs> I, I think we have some questions. Hey, we got a question. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm trying to answer them a little bit as we go. Make sure we're okay. all 
Um, if you click up, open your chat, oh. Judy Costello asked when the prescribed burn classes are. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm probably going to have another one in August. I kind of try to do them around the burn season so I can have a class and then people will burn, you know, get the property ready and have time to burn. Uh, the burn season for the spring is kind of over because everything's ground, uh, you know, greened up now. And then, you know, the humidity stays in the, in the, in the RH, relative humidity stays in the woods longer. Yeah. And, um, and then you get into the nesting season, turkeys and different things. So, um, but we have, we have a fall burn season, a growing season, uh, burn period. And we start burning in August, burn in August, September, you know, in October. So I, I'm, I'll probably do one in August. So what I'll do is when I get ready to have one, um, I'll, uh, I'll send Melissa a, a notification and then she can send it out to all the constituents that, you know, she has on her list. Might be yeah. We can share it on Facebook. So, hey, uh, Facebook, there you go. <laughs> and uh, so I'll probably, we're, we're going to start doing the a, a Learn to Burn One class. It was kind of the basics, you know, kind of get someone out there and burning. And then we're going to do a Learn to Burn Two class in the future that we're just we're starting. To, and that'll be more of a uh, in-depth, more more weather, more just more, just more in-depth period. And uh, we'll have that maybe next, maybe next spring. Maybe I'll do a Learn to Burn One, Learn to Burn, burn, learn, to burn Two. And uh, that'd be good. Yeah. So. Hugh, while we're on the topic of prescribed burning, we have another question that, that I didn't see pop up in the Q&A, but popped up in the chat. Um, somebody was asking, when is the best month to do a prescribed burn? Okay, uh, so it, what depends on what you're burning. If you're burning the timber, if you're burning a timber stand, then generally it's done from January, February, March, okay? Because there's no leaves on the trees, the RH is, you know, RH is generally pretty low. And as long as you hadn't had rain within the last few days a week, then you can, uh, you can and get a good burn in the timber. Sometimes uh, when you try to burn in the fall, in the growing season burn, uh, in the fall, August, September, then the, the RH stays pretty high in the timber and it doesn't, it doesn't burn off very good or it doesn't go very good. But like, but a, but a, a, a grass field, if you're spraying, spraying out and killing a grass field for site prep for a native grass or something, as long as it's dead, spring, fall, either one, uh, all the way through the winter, I mean, they'll, they'll burn good as long as they're dry, so. Is that good? I think so. I think we have a qu another question. Um, are, I, I think they're just looking for more explanation on your prescribed burning must be contract on same acreage. I think. Um. Prescribe burning must be on the same. Yeah, I would guess so. Yeah. He's look. He says he's looking at the NRCS technical services guide, and he says it recommends it. I guess I'm confused. Yeah, I think what he's getting into is um, we're talking about in the the RCPP program um, that he's uh, talking about uh, when you're doing. Excuse me. When when we conduct the forest stand improvement, of, an important part of that is to come back after and do a burn um, to clean up some of that debris. So if you're doing the forest stand improvement, you also are required through that program to do a prescribed burn following uh, the forest stand improvement because both of those practices together are critical um, in order to allow the, the vegetation to regenerate, you also, you wanna open up the canopy with the forest stand improvement and then use the prescribed burn to actually clean up that forest floor so that the sunlight can reach all the way to the soil to allow the vegetation to regenerate. Does that answer your question? That looks, sounds good. 
the only problem with the only problem with doing the uh, doing the burn right after you do forest stand improvement is well, it, I, if you contract it out, it depends on what time of year you do it. But if, if they're if the contractor is going to do it in the summer, they like to have it burned during that that early spring, you know, for you know hold back ticks a little bit and to open you know to burn it up a little bit to where they can see better and get around, I guess you know. But usually, usually do you do the the the, the thinning and then you and you burn. I, that's one thing I, I forgot. On the on the timber stand improvement, on the or on this four stand improvement, you cannot do that yourself unless it's like maybe one acre, because this is a pretty it's 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 a lot of work, and if you don't know, you know what you're doing, and you don't or you don't have the trees previously marked by a forester or something, then you need to you know make sure you, you're contracting that out. So. I, I always tell people that, you know, no, they cannot do the four stand improvement because it's a, it's a lot of work, especially the hacking squirt. I mean, it's, it's some work depending on how, how thick the woods are. So anyways, is that good? Anything else? Um, one more question. Okay. Uh, does someone need a permit to burn if they're doing a grass field? To establish native grass. Okay, yeah, good. That's probably another thing I should have said. So when you're doing a prescribed burn, you don't need a permit. Um, what you're required to do uh, by the state is uh, just call in the day of the burn, uh, call in to the uh, Arkansas, Forestry, uh, Arkansas Forestry Division. It's called Arkansas Forestry Division now. Call them, give your location, what time you're starting, and um, so you notify the Arkansas Forest Division and then you generally notify your, make sure you always notify your county sheriff. And then a lot of times you need to, you know, if you're close to neighbors, you need to notify them, you give them heads up. And then uh, uh, that's, that's what you're required to do. So you don't need a permit necessarily, no. But there's a lot of things about it that you do need to know that would help you to come to a burn class. Uh, and, you know, as far as, not just doing the burn, but the planning and the prep work and all the things that go you know, go into it. So, um, I guess when we when we come out and do site visits and places, you have questions about that, and we can go into that further. Awesome. Okay. Uh, one more question. Okay. Uh, someone's asking: Are the cost share options only available one time? Um, or like for what period of time would they be available? So through Equip, you can do um, cost share, and you, Jessica can correct me, but through Equip, you can, you can put in an Equip application for burning multiple years in a row. You know, through like like with us, with Acres for Wildlife, we used to do cost share with burning. Now we just, me and a crew or something would go to, and burn as part of a project one time for free, you know, no cost share, no payment as part of a project. So, um, but you can generally do that, uh, do, you know, keep putting in applications for prescribed burning. Correct, Jessica? Correct. So each of these practices um, have, as, well, at least through the NRCS, through the EQIP program and the RCPP, they have what we call live spans. Um, which for prescribed burning has a one-year lifespan. So that means that we'll cost share, essentially we can cost share on a burn each year, but we can't cost share on more than one burn on the same acres within that lifespan. Um, but because uh, forest stand improvement obviously has a different lifespan, so until that lifespan is up, you can't come and sign up for the same practice on the same acreage but you could come in and sign up a little bit of acreage at a time if you wanted to break it up into smaller projects and try instead of trying to do um, all of your property at one time. Uh, but those, like I said, those lifespans will be something we'll discuss with you and are different for each practice. But you can come in any time of the year uh, or, you know, put in every year you can come in and put in an EQIP application. There's not a maximum number of applications you can submit. Like what Hugh was saying, you can, you can put one in every year if you wanted to. Yeah. 
Is that good? We we'll move on or got anything else? I think that's it. Okay. Okay, so <clears throat> herbaceous weed control, brush management, uh, Jessica kind of touched on these things. Uh, this, is, this, is just, this is just cost share to help you control uh, some of the things that are popping up out there, you know, if you're doing a native grass restoration or, or whatever, uh, or even uh, in, the, in, the, you know, in the timber too. Um, Johnson grass, Chinese privet, Eastern backers, autumn, autumn olive, red cedar, all that stuff. Uh, so I'll pay you to go out uh, and do it. This guy that's doing right here and uh, give you some herbicide, go out there and spot spray those, um, those thistles and stuff. So, you know, on the, on these RCPP applications and stuff, we can just throw all a bunch of these little things in there too, just to, um, uh, enhance it, help, help it out a little bit. Um, so here's a guy doing it with the backpack. Here's a guy with this tractor. There you go. Lots of different ways to do that one. Any questions? No? All right, uh, so tree and trim establishment. Um, uh, generally why you would do the tree, the, the, the tree or shrub establishment is to give a quail, you know, for the RCPP, like around the National Military Park. If you're doing a quail uh, native grass restoration, project, you, you're trying to give them some cover, some extra cover to hide from predators and such. So, it, you know, you may be planting chicksaw plums and, and things like that. Some kind of like, you know, trees that pop up in patches, you know, and of course, honeysuckle and blackberries and stuff, those are, those are natural um, escape covers. A lot of people will spray those out and get rid of them, but I tell them to leave, leave up some patches here and there, you know because you can always uh, control those with herbicide and stuff, but you're basically, you know, planting that escape cover. So, uh, you know, not a bad little practice to do. All right, so, um, and then, so structures for wildlife. Here's a, here's a pretty cool one, especially when you do forest stand improvement. <clears throat> if you look in this top right picture, uh, they've, they've, this, this landowner has been paid to doze up and create cover by dozing up all this timber that they cut down or maybe like, like red cedar and stuff like that. Uh, you, you, for, for wildlife structure, you don't, you don't pile it up like you're going to burn it, but you pile it up kind of loosely. And then this bottom picture, this is what it would look like in the summer when, you know, you're different, uh, vegetation starts growing up and growing through it and you can tell I mean it's not near as much of an eyesore as it, as it is in the winter but it becomes more you know a really nice little habitat uh, so it provides a lot of cover and stuff and uh, it has to be so large 1500 square foot and uh, this is kind of also edge feathering which you can put it on the edge of your edge of your trees edge of your timber and, and create what everybody around used to have along fence rows you know, brush piles and stuff, you know, um, along fence rows that uh, rabbits and quail and stuff used for cover. And, and now everybody clears them out. And, uh, but anyways, this is a good little practice to, to get you, you know, get you paid to pile up some trees. All right, so now we're into the, the cattle, the grazing deal, the, the forage and biomass planting. This is planting native grass fields to uh, either graze cattle through a rotational grazing plan that you have to have established. And along with that goes the fencing, uh, um, fencing uh, practice where you can use, uh, which I'll get to that in a sec, but anyway, so this forage and biomass planting, it's a lot higher mix on, on native grass, on the grasses component, less on the forbs, but as you can see, it provides a lot of forage for cattle. So if you stock it real heavy, you might get to graze these things for a month or two during the summer. If you graze it pretty light, they can graze it all summer. It just depends on how, how, uh, how dense you stock it. And uh, also too, through this, you can cut this for hay. So I got, you know, I just talked to a guy today. He want, you know, we're gonna possibly, you know, 
get rid of the fescue in his uh, hay pasture, which is just all fescue now, and go in and, and put in native grasses and still cut hay on it. But now he's got a, a pretty grass, you know, then now, you know, eventually he'll have a, a, a nice native grass pasture with some wildflowers, with some forage to make it look a little prettier and have, you know, good structure for wildlife. And, uh, he, but he's just gonna cut hay on it. So he'll cut it one time and have just as much hay as two or three cuttings of, of fescue. So anyways, that's a, that's a whole nother subject, but it, it's, a, it's a really good deal. So uh, if, you're a, if you're a cattle producer, then it's be something to look at for, for a portion of your, of your property, not the whole property, because you need those cool season grasses. You need fescue for a portion of it. Um, but this would be good for say 25 or 30 percent of your your, your grazing uh, area. All right, any questions there? Okay, so the prescribed grazing, uh, this is your grazing plan for the native grasses which you just talked about and as you can see in this picture on the right side you you have four paddocks and you just rotate, you know, either every couple of days or once a week, or, you know, light would be, um, you know, maybe, a, I don't know, maybe two weeks or whatever it is. Uh, it, but it's, it's by NRCS regulations on the deal. So, um, so you have a rotational grazing plan and uh, that's uh, really good for the uh, native grasses as far as, uh, grazing is great for native grasses because it used to be grazed by buffalo across the prairies, right? So uh, grazing with cattle is also good for uh, native grass uh, plus two, and which is still good good habitat for quail and stuff. So, you know, quail can move around. So anyways, uh, prescribed grazing, and that goes along with the fencing. And um, so if you set up some paddocks, you can get help with putting in fencing either barbed wire, you know, uh, you know, four strand barbed wire or electric fences that you can move one to two wire plus or three wire. You have several different types. Um, so uh, some people, some people move electric fences every day or two, you know, and uh, that's a, that's a good, good way to do it too. So the uh, fencing will, will, is a cost share to help you uh, get your, get, you know, your paddocks set up. Any questions? Good. Yeah, there's some, there's a few questions. Um, hey, all right. So uh, Judy's asking how she can schedule an agent to come help establish a grazing plan on her property. How would you go about um, doing that? Uh, so that would probably be more along the uh, talking to the district conservationists there at the NRCS office. Uh, I mean, that's kind of what they do a lot more than, than wildlife stuff generally, is they do a lot of the ag um, side of things. So I, I would say you talk to your NRCS office on that. Yeah. I mean, I've never done a grazing plan, so to speak, you know. So, right, Jessica, have your DC come out? Right. Um, so, well, and, you know, contacting your NRCS office. I know that the Fayetteville office and the Harrison office over where I am, they do have a uh, grassland specialists in those offices that can come and visit your property to complete one of those plans for you. But if you want their information, just contact um, your local NRCS office and they'll put you in contact with those specialists. Yeah. Awesome. Um, we have one more question. Uh, when are applications due? I'm I guess, are there deadlines for EQIP applications right now? I know for the West Fork Watershed, we just passed our EQIP deadline, but. Um. Yes, so while applications, um, for any of these programs, applications are accepted on a year round basis. So you can turn in your application um, at any time. However, um, for the fiscal year, we have to stop taking them for, for payment at some point in time. Um, so, for example, for fiscal year 2020 for the federal programs, that application deadline was February 28th. 
Um, any applications received after that date will be eligible for funding next fiscal year, um, but you can still come in at any time and put in an application. And for the Game and Fish programs, um, those applications are also accepted year round. And um, we typically uh, fund those projects or give out supplies until we run out. Um, so if you, I'd say as quickly as possible, if you can get in there and get it done, the quicker the better. Yeah, uh -huh. as far as acres for wildlife, you just, just, just whenever you just, we, we, we throw them out there willy nilly, you know, <laughs> so, so, uh, you just holler at us, we'll, uh, we'll come out. All right. Well, there's one more question. Okay. Um, the landowner is establishing their land for quail, so. Who would they contact for getting a plan to manage their land for quail? This, me, me or Jessica, either one. Awesome. Yeah, and if you're not, like I was saying earlier, um, if, you're, if you're not in one of my counties or one of Hughes counties, um, refer back to, once this is published tomorrow, uh, just refer back to the, to the maps that I gave you and there should be a biologist that covers um, every county. So contact whoever is in your county. Yeah. We good there? Um, one more. Are okay. application for Acres for Wildlife online or are you open during the pandemic? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It hadn't really changed anything for me. So, Great. you know, actually what you can do is since y'all are already, most of all, you are already in with the uh, beer watershed folks, you just, if you just want to call Melissa and she'll send me your, or just email her and she'll forward it to me. Yeah, I'd be happy to do that if anybody's interested to send me your information and I will forward it. I guess my information is on there, but I, at the end of my deal, I did not think to put my, I, I did not think to put a slide at the end of my deal. Sorry. I guess I could do that real quick though. Well, at, at the end, I could type it in there real fast. You can put it in the chat. You can put your email in the chat box. Okay, we'll do that. Um, and then, yeah. Donna's raised her hand. You got one more question? I think that's it. I can't. Oh, okay, Donna was an accident that you were good to go. Okay, all right. So moving on, so the rotational grazing, the biomass forage planting, the exclusion fencing, and the heavy use area. This is another cattle deal. So the heavy use area is when, you know, for your feeding areas. Uh, like I say, this is probably a, a district conservationist deal too, but um, the, through NRCS, but anyways, uh, it's just, it's, creating areas, you know, where you're feeding and concentrating your cattle on a daily basis, um, creating a place for them uh, to do that, for you to do that without making your fields look, you know, uh, just like big mud holes, basically. So your water troughs, like the bottom right picture, where you're watering areas, you got your fence in, in between, they can get water right there. It's just a good way to, to not uh, destroy your fields all the time. It's erosion preventative measure. So, uh, heavy use area, pretty good deal. Any anything on that? No questions on that. Okay. And then, of course, watering facilities. You know, here you have your trough, your your uh, automatic uh, ball troughs, whatever they call those tanks. Um, here's a tank down at the bottom. Um, along with the water facilities, you have the um, livestock pipelines. Sometimes they'll you, they'll fence off a pond. Uh, you can fence off a pond and, and, and pump the water out of the pond. That way your pond stays. I don't know why all cattle folks don't do this, I, I, but uh, you know, I'm just saying. I remember my grandpa's old, old, old ponds. They're all just 
mud holes, you know, and, you know, you can't, you don't stock them with fish or anything or anything because they're just big mud holes. I mean, you can fence them off, pump the water out to a trough, and you're feeding your cow good, clean water and all that. Anyways, whatever. Uh, it's easy to just feed them and, you know, let them feed out a pond, I'm, I know, I'm sure. So, uh, any questions on the watering facilities? No questions. Yeah, this, this makes a lot of sense to me, the, the watering, uh, the water tanks. Good, clean water. All right. Um, I, I think there may be one or two more um, that I didn't get on there, but they're, they were kind of small ones or whatever. So uh, anyways, just to uh, reiterate, you know, some things to think about, just if you think about how this applies to your, to your, your properties and your land and, and uh, on these projects, putting in these projects, they do rank out against other projects. So the more, pro the more uh, practices you put in there, the more resources, concerns or whatever you, you meet, so to speak, and you know, the higher you'll rank out. So uh, anyways, it's a, it's a good program. And uh, I'm sure uh, a lot of you will have a lot of questions. So uh, when you start thinking about it, is there anything else, any other questions that you think of? Let me go to my, let me go to this chat up here. And so I put my, Okay, there you go. There, here you can see the regions. Um, this right here is up here in the, in the Quell Forever side. This is Jessica's area. Uh, Newton, Cersei, Marion, Boone, Carroll. And then over here, I, get, I got these six counties up in the northwest corner. So there's my information right there. Boom. There's my cell phone. And then there's my email right there. So I'll leave that up there for a second. If uh, write that down or something. Any questions come in? Uh, uh, yes, there is. Um, can you have more than one practice in forest at a time? Well, forest and improvement, fire breaks, prescribed burning. So, um, and those generally all always go together anyways. So I don't ever do one without the other. I'll tell you that. And I'll throw in there too, that, um, you know, the more practices you have, typically the more resource concerns you're addressing. So if you're going through a cost share program, you want to include as many practices as you can. Um, that'll increase your, your ranking and increase your chances of getting funded. Okay. Great. I think that was all the questions. I don't see any more new ones. Um, but I want to thank both Jessica and Hugh for give their presentations today. They were awesome. I hope everybody learned a lot. I know I did. Um, this, I will be posting this video on YouTube tomorrow and I'll be sending out an email with the link to um, that video. But if you have any questions, feel free to contact BWA. We'll be happy to connect you with you or Jessica um, or provide you with more information if you need it on any of, of these things. Thank you. Um, before we go real quick, there were a couple of questions that I answered. Um, but while he was talking, uh, one of those that I thought was a good question that I really wanted to hit on was um, a question from Don. It said, what options are there for landowners whose property is not a farm, but who still want to be involved in land and wildlife conservation? It's a very good question because I know oftentimes when we're talking, we throw out the term um, farmer and rancher a lot. Uh, however, wildlife in, in and of itself is considered a resource concern. So I do want to point out that you don't have to be an actual um, farm, um, you know, either by tax definition. You don't have to have livestock. You don't have to have crops. Uh, if you've got forest land or you've got open fields that we can convert, 
and your main objective for your property is wildlife, you are eligible for all of these uh, programs that we've talked about. Um, you know, the, the, this terminology comes back when NRCS was first uh, developed as the soil and water conservation after the Dust Bowl. Um, it was really more focused on farmland and ranch land, but that's since changed and has expanded to just about every land use that is available, um, even including uh, some practices that we can implement in more urban areas. So just wanted to point out, you don't have to actually be a farm in order to be eligible. That's a good point. That's a good point again, Jessica. <laughs> that is an awesome point. Isn't it? If you live in the West Fork watershed of the White River and the Beaver, Beaver Lake watershed, please get contact us. There's special resources for that area because it is an RCPP project area. Um, so yeah, feel free to contact me. Um, I can, I don't know if I can, I'll share my screen. I think I have my com my email on there. Um, but yeah, my email is at the bottom there if you'd like to contact me about that. Um, but thank you, everybody. And um, if nobody has any other questions, <laughs> I can yeah. Wait, so someone asked a question. What about snakes? Yeah. <laughs> uh, what about snakes? Um, I like snakes. I think snakes are, uh, you know, a very important part of the ecosystem. Uh, a lot of people don't like them, especially if they're trying to uh, increase quail populations, because obviously there are several species of snakes that, um, that do, uh, you know, prey on the eggs and prey on the quail. Um, but in general, you know, as with any other predator that's out there, um, you know, with good habitat, you quail have always had to deal with, with predation. They're a prey species. Everything eats them, bless their heart. I mean, everything eats them. Um, so they've always had to deal with the pressures of predation. Um, what we're seeing, though, is with the lack of habitat, their, their ability to avoid predation is what is declining. So with good habitat, we can mitigate some of those predation issues um, for not just snakes, but for any other predators. I don't know if that was your question was about predation or not, um, but that's my take on it. There, there's nothing that we do practice-wise that will increase or decrease snakes. So, uh, you know, let us be there, but. Yeah, that's not the first time I've, I've been asked about that is whether these native grasses and forb plantings are going to draw in and attract snakes. Um, if you see an increase in snakes, that's probably just because you're seeing a lot of things other than quail, your mice, everything are gonna utilize these plots too. Um, so, I'm not saying you won't see an uptick in snakes if they're there, just because you might see an uptick in their prey that they eat. All right. Thank you. Everybody had some really good questions and I appreciate everyone's participation. Um, I hope everyone has a great day and please email any of us if you have any questions. So I'm gonna shut this down. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, guys. Okay. Thank y'all. And